Welcome so much to this session on new funds doing new things. I'm Per Granqvist, I'm the sustainability editor of Veckans Affare, which is the biggest business weekly in Scandinavia. I'm also author of a book called CSR in Praktiken on how business make money on becoming more sustainable. For the next hour we'll hear about why some of new funds are doing new things and investing in this exciting field to make more money. For those who are wishing to comment on what's said here on stage um, or want to share your ideas on this session, please do so on Twitter and use the hashtag uh, SOCAPDTF or hashtag IMPINV, which is short for Impact Investment. I -M -P -I -N -V. This event is broadcasted live and for those uh, it will be available for later viewing on the SOCAP website. For those of you who are, uh, you can see here, we're having some, are you better now? All right. This event is broadcasted live and will be available for later viewing on the SOCAP website. For those who you wish to connect to people in this room or outside it, please do so on the SOCAP website, SOCAP Connect, or you can check in on Foursquare. You can also join the group SOCAP Sweden on LinkedIn or join our group on Facebook at facebook.com slash social capital markets. So let's kick this session off. Um, when Andrew Cargany wrote his Gospel of Wealth in 1889, little did he know that his thinking would come to color the way we look on donations for over a century. He wrote that the life on the just donation should be divided into two parts. The first part was about accumulating as much money as possible, and the second part of a man's life should be to giving it away to short charitable causes. And for more than a century, NGOs have been asking us to donate, uh, and in an incredibly more um, competitive landscape, there's argument that sort of boil down to uh, one thing, and that, that we should be give them money because they have low overhead costs, that they are effective. And in a lot of companies, there have been a lot of watchdog websites that popped up that make, enables you to compare different NGOs and their effectiveness to one another. The problem, however, is when if you choose an NGO who donate to based on the way they, on the lower overhead cost, it's like choosing an airline to fly on based on who has the lowest maintenance costs. Or it's like choosing a school based on who pays the least, the least to teachers, or checking into a low cost hospital for your next surgery. It actually says nothing on how effective the organization is in addressing the problem it wants to erase. So even if you're donating to an NGO, they might say 95% of the money that you're giving away to distributing condoms in HIV AIDS struck communities, it might be a more effective way to teach people on how the virus is transmitted and how to have safer sex. So we have to choose to spend our money, donate our money, based on what gets the maximum effect in addressing the problems in the world we want to erase. Polio and measles are terrible but curable diseases, and still dozens of millions of people every year get those diseases in countries like, for example, Niger in Africa. And this is a problem that good-hearted philanthropists like Belinda and, and, and um, Bill and Melinda Gates had tried to erase from the face of the earth. And over the past five years, they donated more than $200 million into measles immunization and research worldwide. One of the projects they've been investing in is in the Niger Delta. And five years ago, the LA Times ran a story about a 14-year-old boy who's got his polio shot thanks to the Gates Foundation. But what was threatening to his health was not um, measles or polio, but the fact that the Italian energy giant Eni was burning gas less than a mile away, which was causing him respiratory trouble. So the paradox here is that Eni, and one of the big investors in Eni at the time of the article, was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so this caused a debate on how companies and the foundation who want to give money away should invest in order to make the money they have grow even more. This was the first time I heard of impact investment and what was a, seemed to me like a perfect solution to our want to give and get more in turn than just the financial values. As many of you know by hand, by first hand these days, one of the best way of doing addressing problems is by inventing in entrepreneurs that are trying to solve problems locally. By providing ordinary people like you and me with knowledge in order to become more financially active, in order to start businesses and provide them with fair incomes for the products and services they produce. And this is something I've seen firsthand 
as a board member of the Hand in Hand and the vice chairman of the Fair Trade Association in Sweden. Business is a great way to address and solve problems in the world that the, and provide sustainable solutions to those problems. In impact investment, however, you also have the opportunity to get your money back. And that's why it's such a fast-growing asset class today. It's not a movement anymore, as we heard here of these two days, but it's about the return of investments. It's real, and it is really changing the way we address problems. And that's why we, in this session, gathered a bunch of interesting new funds to tell us how they do it from very different perspectives. And I asked them to come here to share for five, ten minutes their perspective on their ideas, their experiences of what they've done. Um, and then I will follow up here with a few questions to each and one of them to help you get even more into this topic and get more out of them. I will later open up the floor for discussions for the audience as well. Not long ago, Oxfam was asking by their donors if there was some way that they could actually invest in projects and rather just give money to them. And so it came to be that the Symbotics Group created a fund with them. If you are to take on some of the world's toughest problems, you want someone who is calm, methodological, play a lot of attention to details. In other words, someone from Switzerland. You also want them to have a deep understanding of human rights, maybe experience from the Department of Foreign Affairs, and why not throw in a couple of years at the Swiss private banks for just because you have the opportunity to uh, handle a lot of money. Our first speaker in this session fits, fits that description perfectly and joined Symbotics as the first employee and was successively investment manager, regional manager, and client relationship manager. Please give a warm hand to Fabio Sofia from Symbotics Group. I think you forgot to say I was the, the first in charge of the coffee machine also <laughs> at Symbiotics. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I represent Symbiotics. I'm in charge of the business development and sales. Uh, Symbiotics means the art of living together. So there is a social mission um, to, to target the micro, small and medium enterprises in developing countries. Uh, why Geneva? Uh, for those that know about, about a bit about microfinance, it's true that in, micro in Geneva there are several companies that have started. Um, the story, the short story is that we have the United Nations and the private bankers that live in the same city. Uh, and, and it's because of these two actors that at a certain point in, during the 2000, they, they joined their effort to create the first commercial fund that is now the Dexia microcredit fund that is managed by Blue Orchard. Um, and, and the founders of Blue Orchard left to, to create Symbiotics in 2004. So we've been created in December 2004. Uh, we work in more than 45 countries. We've originated a thousand transactions for more than $1 billion. Um, initially, in, in 98, the United Nations decided to uh, dedicate the year 2006 for the year of microcredit. So at that time, people were talking about microcredit and not microfinance or financial inclusion, or not even impact investing, which is something that is pretty new. So th this, this concept of microcredit or microfinance is a changing definition. Um, at the beginning, people were focused on, 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 on giving access through a credit to micro entrepreneur. Uh, uh, soon we realized that the micro entrepreneur uh, needs more than the credit, but probably savings, insurance, or any type of other financial services. So we start talking about, about uh, microfinance as a, as a concept, including all the different products. Soon later, people starting talking about financial inclusion because we realized that a micro entrepreneur is a bit reductive, that there are other segments that can be targeted and are not necessarily micro, but it can be very small, small or medium. And, and there, there is a, a great need for, for financing. So um, for us, it was also important to evolve uh, in, in that direction and, 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 and be able to, to answer all the different needs that either investors or uh, financial institutions were asking on the ground. So I just want to, 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 to clarify one thing in, in terms of our investment value chain that has not changed uh, over the last seven years. We, we essentially work with financial intermediaries on the ground. 
We don't work directly with micro entrepreneurs or small enterprises because we believe that the local expertise is key and the proximity to the, the enterprises is also something very important. And naturally, uh, the fact that uh, average loans go between $1,000 to $3,000 makes that it's impossible for us to, to, to support the cost of going directly. So the investment value chain is pretty easy. You have the, the social investor or mainstream investor investing in a fund and the fund will invest in a financial institution and that's where we provide the services. Um, and the financial institution then uh, will offer um, the, the products to their target client that are micro, small or, or medium enterprises. Uh, that means also that um, there are different strategies. Um, at the beginning we were talking about only microfinance. Uh, it was fixed income essentially. Today you have multi-assets. There are funds that are doing mezzanine or uh, mezzanine loans. There are funds that, are, that have started to do equity also a few years ago. Uh, in terms of strategies, you have also different type, type of, of, of strategy um, in, in our universe. It can be uh, on a region, it can be on a, on a country, of course. It can be on a topic like, like women, like agribusiness, like food, like housing, jobs. So you, you can see that uh, what we do, and we are known for being, a, a, I think, a, a one of the leading companies in microfinance, uh, for us, it's, uh, there are a lot of strategies that we can, that, that we can offer to an investor. It's not like a simple uh, world, but it's a diverse, it's, it's, it can be rather complex. So what about small enterprises? Um, small enterprises, people say it's a, it, there is a missing middle because microfinance has had a, a, a large success over the last 10 years. There are a lot of funding going to micro segments but much less to the very small, small or medium segments. Um, so we, we know that 99% of the private sector, of empl employees in the private sector, 99% are micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, we also know that they need a, a lot of capital to, to grow and their average growth in our universe is about 40%, so it's quite substantial. Um, so, um, in our world at Symbiotics, although we do microfinance, um, out of 600 institutions that we have visited, uh, nearly 200 reported a small enterprise portfolio. So, what, did it, what does it mean for us? It means that the, the, the business counts uh, between more than 10 employees, up to 100. So as long as you, you fit these criteria, you, you are considered as, as a, a small enterprise. So it's very important that uh, a microfinance institution is also trying to grow with its, with its clientele and not stop once the clientele is reaching the small size or the medium size. So um, in our, our universe, uh, we, we, we've been already exposed to about 12 billion total assets in small enterprises. Uh, we've, we've also started uh, screening a bit the market and we realized that there are about 112 specialized small SME banks, so uh, banks that are essentially targeting the small and medium segments. And that amounts to $17 billion. Uh, then we continue a bit our analysis and we realized that uh, there are about 260 specialized local funds that can qualify as local intermediaries. Uh, so those local funds with local expertise are, are pretty new. 60% were created after 2006. Um, there is about 15 billion committed and 73%, and, and so two, uh, three quarter, are related to equity investments. Um, so last year, um, Oxfam UK, uh, Oxfam GB, sorry, um, uh, they decided to, 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 to go to funds and to launch a fund and to promote a, an investment fund, something that is pretty new for a, a, one of the largest uh, non-profit uh, institution in the world, active in developing uh, countries. Um, so th they had the idea to, to, to find a partner, to, to create a joint initiative, uh, to launch a fund dedicated to the small segment, essentially, and, and, and with the idea of being a reference product, a reference in the sense of, of, of showing that uh, an NGO, a non-profit NGO, can ha also have um, 
um, the intention to, to propose a fund to its donor-based clientele and also reference product in the sense of showing that, yes, we can do something for small enterprises. Uh, with, with this multi-strategy of using financial intermediaries, as I said, a microfinance bank that has a portfolio in, in, small, in, a, in small SME segments, a specialized bank or a local fund. Uh, so that's what we are doing right now. We are launching the fund. Uh, I mean, officially it has been launched now. We are in the process of raising money. Um, so we are very happy to, 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 to enlarge a bit our, 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 our um, universe of, of, of microfinance. So uh, answering a bit uh, uh, the question about the evolution of, of our uh, industry. Um, so will be Symbiotics the, the fund manager of the fund and Oxfund will be the impact measurement advisor. So uh, this fund will accumulate a lot of financial uh, return and social impact measurement. So it's very important for, for them that each loan, uh, before it gets to the financial analysis, it, it goes through uh, different criteria uh, that prove that there is an impact, that, that can be an impact on, on the society or on the environment. So that's it. If you have any question, uh, I'm available. Thank you. Um. OK, let's start again. Um, what have you learned so far from the Oxfam partnership? That they are very good. <laughs> no, they are very um, innovative. Uh, we were surprised to see such an institution coming to us and mixing a bit. As you can understand, they are generally coming to people uh, to trust foundations so, so they can get the money for free. And now they're coming and saying, look, um, it's complementary to what we do. It's not against uh, donation. It's just that you can do good also by investing in something and get a return. Uh, and the, 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 um, there are different topics. We talked about a lot about impact investing. There are different topics in, in impact investing. One is job creation or micro businesses. And, and those businesses, they need money. So access to capital, the best way is to to do it in the regular way, I would say. But of course, for health, for, for other topics, uh, you need donations. How important do you think that fund will be in sort of getting more people to understand that the that impact investment exists and it's a real asset class? Uh, um, w Symbiotic's pretty well known in the industry of, of microfinance, uh, but having a, a, a joint partnership with, with Oxfam opens a lot of doors, especially in the UK, which is the largest financial market. So a lot of people now are, are getting interested in, in the impact investing space, also because there is now an example of a big institution entering the market. So for us, it's a great opportunity go to England and, 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 and present this topic and, and present the impact investing, which is up to now uh, mostly related to local uh, impact yep. uh, project rather than, than in developing countries. And talking about local impact projects, I mean, you talked about that missing link. That, I mean, there's uh, the, the middle-sized companies that are trying to sort of scale even further. Is that something you see also when it comes to social entrepreneurs, that you, you would get funding for the little ones, the new ones, but the ones in the middle are having smaller difficulties? Actually. Yes, yes, there is a, I mean, it's, I think it's anywhere in the world, not only in developing countries. Um, the micro segments are, are pretty easy because the story is easy. Uh, everybody imagine uh, the, the, the simple story of a the cute self, entrepreneur. Yeah, of the cute entrepreneur, self-employed, uh, living with his family and, 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 and requiring a loan of $200. And, and people like the story, it's simple, and they like to invest in there. Um, the, the reality is that when they start growing, if he grows, because they're not always growing, yeah? mm. uh, but if he grows, uh, he starts having employees and it's getting much more complex. And then you have to face other type of needs. It can be uh, not only like working capital, which is typical something for microfinance, it can be fixed assets. So you start doing leasing, you start, they start needing mezzanine loans or even equity. So it's another world. It's, it's yeah. much more complex. So it's have, it has been a bit left aside because of this complexi complexity. But the, the potential, the potential is great in terms of growth, but also in terms of impact. Uh, some people would say that SME segments are more sustainable yeah. because they create an environment uh, through, with employees and uh, because we don't have to think that all uh, in all everybody uh, there is an entrepreneur. Uh, some people are they're just not entrepreneur. They, they, they survive uh, yep. by, by being self-employed, but they would rather be employed and get the, the, the pension, uh, the, you know, all yep. these things. So, 
We'll hear more from you later on. We'll join you at the discussion. Thank you so much. A hand for Fabio Sofia. Thank you very much. Our next guest is someone who has a lot to share, um, given the fact that he's been involved in the impact investment and social enterprise space for the last four years. Um, he has experience from working with projects across India, and China and Indonesia. And even though it sounds like he's all occupied with solving world problems, he sometimes still finds time to co-chair the Impact Investing Initiative at Brigham Young University's Ballard Center for Economic Self-Reliance. Something that just that took sort of 40 seconds. Please welcome our next speaker, Bo Seel from Unitas Impact. <laughs> welcome. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of background on what we've been doing, uh, Unitas Impact was launched back in February of last year and really was a for profit spin out of a group called Unitas, which worked on microfinance acceleration for the last 10. Uh, really, what ended up happening is through the work that we did. Uh, not myself individually, but the group Unitas as, a, as an organization. Tremendous work in microfinance, uh, partnered with 28 microfinance institutions globally to help them grow at about twice as fast as, as the industry. Um, and, oh, closer, sorry. <laughs> and, and what we started to see was that there was, although microfinance was a very, very important tool, to help lift people out of poverty, it wasn't the only thing. And no one ever thought it would be the magic bullet, at least within the organization, to solve poverty. And so the board members of Unitas 10 years ago said, this is our first project. Let's help grow these things. Let's help show that they're commercially scalable, can attract commercial capital, and can reach millions of people, just as BRAC and Grameen had done over about a 20 or 30 year period. And when we decided to make the shift out of microfinance, the question was, well, what's next? What's on the horizon? What are the things that need to be funded to really help improve the lives of the poor? And what we started to see that was that those microfinance loans would take someone so far, but then you had the idea a little bit, as probably I was saying earlier, is that you have something called a forced entrepreneur, and then you have an op opportunity entrepreneur. And we tend to glamorize the idea of the opportunity entrepreneur who's going out, starting revolutionary companies to change the world. But what we saw was the forest entrepreneur really doesn't have a lot of time, or the person who's walking around peddling wares doesn't have a lot of time to really think through a long-term long strategic value. And most people would rather just have a job which they can feed their family uh, and have a comfortable existence. And where we went with was, hey, there's these businesses that we're seeing, we're seeing you know, really good opportunity entrepreneurs who are starting larger businesses that are providing better livelihoods for the poor. And when I say livelihoods, I mean just really incomes. And what, what we started to target was a core group of entrepreneurs who we thought were starting these livelihood ventures. And really a lot of them were in things such as agriculture, dairy, fishing, salt production, or using micro-franchising as a tool to really provide new opportunities to people in rural areas. To give you one example, uh, we funded a company last year called Ruma, which was actually launched in collaboration with Grameen Foundation. Uh, about four years earlier, and was providing the opportunity for, for women shopkeepers to actually sell through their mobile phones, mobile top-up minutes, and they didn't have to carry the inventory costs at that point. They basically sent in an SMS code to the room of server, said this person with me wants to buy, I guess you could say, you know, 50,000 rupiah of uh, telecom cell minutes. Then they'd send them a code, the woman would sell that code to the person who was paying them, and basically would enter it in their phone, they would top up their minutes, and they had no inventory carrying costs. So at that point, they're able to sell something without having to buy any inventory, uh, don't need a loan. It's really, they're just a distribution point where, just due to the, I mean, I'll make a long story short, in Indonesia, there's about 13 telecoms. It's a very fragmented market. It's very difficult for any one telecom to actually get their minutes out to the last mile. And Really what we've done since then is uh, we helped back a really, really strong entrepreneur and his, his team. They've added a whole bunch of other products such as prepaid utility payments uh, and are starting to do consumer surveys for large consumer goods companies all based on the mobile phone. And they've built an agent network of about 5,000 agents at the current time and they're growing, looking to grow that to about 60 to 80,000 agents over the next few years. And you know, so that's one company, we funded a dairy company in India that's really going down to the first mile as well, boosting incomes of dairy farmers by about 36%, just by helping them increase their yields and also preserving milk quality. So what ends up happening is just to give you a quick idea, it's kind of like the hub and spoke model on steroids where 
There's a milk collection center in every single village that they operate. Two women run that. And two times a day, all the dairy farmers in the area bring their milk in. They sell it to these women who do preliminary testing. And then twice a day, a very small truck comes by, picks up these 40 liter jerry cans, and takes it to a bulk milk chilling center. And then at that bulk milk chilling center, it's the uh, milk quality is preserved because it's being chilled within three hours. And what Harsh has done is he's, he's put, put this company together, which really is going to become a very strong aggregation platform of milk and also fruits and vegetables and some other things. And then also a very strong distribution platform going down because they are moving physical goods and inventory. So when people used to talk a lot about microfinance institutions being a distribution system to the poor, uh, what was difficult is that they were trying to push you know, physical goods and services. Well, Harsh is just doing physical goods, and ser physical goods up and down a value chain. So we've funded about four companies. We funded four companies. Uh, we're getting ready to do another one here in the next couple months. Um, really focused on livelihoods. And the idea that we have is that we're just trying to show some very simple metrics. We're not trying to burden our entrepreneurs with a whole bunch of different things. Because embedded in every one of their business models is that they need to improve the incomes either of the farmers or uh, of the agents that they work with. Otherwise, there's no value in that company. And you know, some people say, what about mission drift? Will the company, you know, in the end, start cramming down margins on their entrepreneurs? Well, the only thing that they have is their, is their agents, is their distribution network. So if someone were to come in and buy that company, they would completely eradicate all the enterprise value of that company if they started to, I guess you could say, screw the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and, and you can see it happening. If people feel like they're not getting paid enough, they say, this isn't worth my time. I'm not going to do this anymore. And so kind of we, we don't you know, put a lot of things in stone that you always have to be doing X, Y, or Z in order for you to hit these different social metrics. But we do make them report on what's the income increase. So at a very baseline, when we start, when we start funding the company, what are people making who aren't working with the company yet? And then after they start working with the company, how do they start to move out of poverty? How much more money are they making? How many more new jobs are being created? And we kind of take it from there. And uh, kind of what we're looking to do is, that, you know, as opposed to a traditional kind of blind pool fund, which I think a lot of us are very, you know, very familiar with, and for those of you who kind of don't know how funds are structured, really, as opposed to putting together, you know, $50 million uh, from, from investors and then, you know, charging a 2% management fee and 20% carry. What we've done is we're trying to really prove that these businesses are viable, that there is a pipeline of these companies. When I say livelihood ventures, nobody knows what I'm talking about for a good reason because we're trying to show that these are a different type of business. And kind of our approach has been, well, let's, let's find a core group of really committed, high net worth individuals, family offices, foundations who believe that this could be the next I guess the next type of business to invest into to help alleviate poverty. And then let's just put together, together deals on a deal by deal basis, back these companies, give them the tools that they need, um, and really go from there. So we're constantly growing our pipeline of investees, our pipeline of investors, trying to do it in a very transparent way. And, and really, kind of at the end of the day, uh, taking an approach which Unitas has always had of backing entrepreneurs as opposed to backing real ideas. Um, and providing them with everything that they need to move forward. So we spend a tremendous amount of time helping to bake business models with the entrepreneurs, iterating. It's not just a straight investment fund which, um, where we're trying to get assets under management and go from there. Because if we have failed to prove that you can help generate wealth with the poor as opposed to just selling things to them, we think that we've failed in our mission to actually prove the viability of livelihood ventures. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'll stand over here. Um, I know that you have a great interest in starting the development of major cities. Um, and so, which role does our social entrepreneurship play in creating sort of a great city or a great neighborhood? Yeah, I think that, you know, what we've seen, uh, whether it's in Jakarta or whether it's in, you know, rural India, is just economic development really helps people feel very tied to their community and take a lot of ownership in their community. And um, whether it's women who can feel more pride because they're actually able to make more money and send their children to school, uh, it, it really is helping to build a lot of community cohesion um, and making people feel a lot better about themselves. So it, really the whole idea is people aren't looking for a handout, they're just looking for an opportunity and we're trying to back businesses that provide a reduced risk opportunity for people to provide incomes for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Harvard Business Professor Robert Putnam famously argued in his book Bowling Alone that social capital makes us community successful. And how important are those social entrepreneurs in creating that capital? Or have, are they having difficulties in getting the capital they want to scale the business? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a double... I mean, anybody who works in the space, it's kind of one of those double-edged things where everybody says, oh, there's not enough investment opportunities, but then where do I get my capital? And where we're trying to play right now is kind of in that, I guess, weird area. You know, there's, there's lack of funding for entrepreneurs and lack of good businesses all around the... I mean, I think it's kind of a misnomer for us to say if we just, if we, if we just provide more capital, it's kind of this virtuous cycle, yeah. which we see of, of venture capital and whether it's in Silicon Valley when things started to move forward. I think that what you're going to start to see is as we build the whole ecosystem, whether it's seed funders uh, who are starting to come on the scene, like Village Capital or uh, Unitas just started a, a new seed fund, which is funding people with fifty dollars to $100,000, or if it's where we're playing between $500,000 and a million in equity, or, you know, you need everybody all up and down the chain. And I think it just takes time. Obviously, we're all impatient, and we all want it to happen quicker. Um, but it, I think if we just kind of trudge forward and, and, and do our best, and everybody kind of take a new niche, uh, to filling that ecosystem is just going to continue Do you recognize, grow. I mean, do you see the same problem that the Fabio was talking about, I mean, the missing middle, that the, the people that want to scale up, they have difficulties getting capital? Yeah, so if you're talking about small and medium enterprises, we definitely see that. We funded a company in Bangalore, India called Canera Capital that does just that. They fund small-scale manufacturing companies who are trying, who just need access to inventory financing so that they can increase their turnover and meet new, new contracts, or they need to buy some new, I guess you could say, some new assets, which they can actually increase production. So it's so a pure capacity building money they're providing. Yeah, I mean, that, they're providing two to six thousand dollar loans yeah. to companies who want to hire more people and want to increase how many orders that they can take on. So we definitely see that. Okay, thank you so much. We'll join you later. Um, our next speaker is one of the leading uh, social investment managers in the UK, and until recently he was head of CAF VentureSum, a ten million pound investment company, uh, social investment fund and he's managed investment in more than 200 social purpose and organizations. And he's also the chair of the European Social Investment Task Force, which advises EU member states on national social investment strategies. Please welcome Paul Cheng. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting time in the UK. We have a growing and vibrant social investment marketplace that is continuing to evolve. We've been on a journey for 12 years now, and a number of new um, infrastructure for the market is beginning to assume form. There's a growing body of expertise around social investment, and we are in a, in a it feels like we're almost entering a sort of new golden age of social investment in the UK. It's still very fragile, and it's, uh, there are a lot of dangers ahead in the shaping of this market. Shared Impact is a charity whose mission is to improve the financial efficiency and effectiveness of other charities and social enterprises. And was, is, is a sort of logical creation um, of coming out of the development of the social investment marketplace. The, the need is around working capital to charities and civil society organizations. That is an overlooked need, and that is one of the you know, insights we've had in the last 10 years around investing in charity and social enterprises, is that the financial needs of these organizations are similar, if not the same, as the financial needs of small businesses, especially around working capital and balance sheet funding. So that may sound very boring and mundane, but unless we get that right, we're not going to build this social investment marketplace and the pipeline of investment organized of, of charities and social enterprises that are investable will be broken. So it's it's a it's it's a it's a growing it's a it's it's a very sort of unseen and deep need that is often overlooked by investors. And it sounds um, very boring, but unless we can get that right, then we have a real problem with our civil society. I, I think that there's actually um, a big danger happening within the UK market. 
that there is almost a silent collapse happening within our small and medium-sized charities because of access to this capital. It's almost like we are a marathon runner with a heart condition. And unless we have more funds providing direct finance to frontline organizations tackling this problem, then the backbone of our civil society will begin to erode. So that's the particular focus that I, where I stand in the social investment marketplace. There are lots of other developments happening which are really exciting. New products, um, charitable bonds. We've heard about the scope bond that Jeff Bernan talked about yesterday. We have new market infrastructure. We have um, a new social central bank or big society capital, which is providing capital and liquidity to financial intermediaries within the UK market. We have the social stock exchange, which is launching next year. We have new platforms such as FX, which will make um, access to ethical products easier for the consumer. So there's a whole range of market infrastructure that is taking place. I think it's important in this movement as we engage in our particular funds, what, you know, what is the success? What does success look like? And what are we actually trying to build? We're trying to build a robust social investment marketplace. And in each of our ways, we're all contributing to that. But what does that mean? What is a robust social investment marketplace? It has four key elements. And at the moment, we, all four key elements in the UK are weak and fragile. We need a resilient supply of capital that is using a range of financial instruments. So we need intelligent supply of capital that uses everything from debt, equity, equity-like instruments, and philanthropic capital. And I think there's a huge misunderstanding around the power of philanthropic capital. There needs to be a distinction, a clearer distinction between grant making, grants for projects, and the use of philanthropic capital. In other words, capital that you can afford to give away. The capital that you can afford to give away is the most powerful type of capital because it can absorb infinite risk. If you can afford to give away money, then surely you can use that money in many interesting high financial risk but high social impact ways. So for example, you can use them in guarantee funds. You can use philanthropic capital to create new types of financial instruments because you can use that capital, for example, in a first loss piece. So you can enable different types of funds to be created. There needs to be more understanding around the use and the imaginative use of philanthropic capital. And I think the challenge is for foundations, who are the primary stewards of such capital, to be much more imaginative in the way they deploy their endowments and the use of their grant making. There needs to be intelligent demand from organizations. And that, again, is a huge problem in the UK market, and I suspect around the world. So it's one thing to have a supply of capital, but how are you going to deploy that capital out? Civil society organizations, social enterprises, tend to have very simplistic understanding of finance. There, there needs to be much better understanding of financial statements and how organizations are run on a financial basis. So in particular, a real understanding about profit and loss, the balance sheet and cash flow. And what I find is that organizations tend to instinctively understand profit and loss and have a very poor understanding of the balance sheet. And that is a problem. And it's also a problem on the funder side. You know, funders also don't pay enough attention to the funding of balance sheets. And fourthly, the market needs efficient matching mechanisms. We need more intermediaries in the market that can signpost and efficiently match the supply of capital with the demand of capital. And again, one of the issues in the UK and one of the reasons for the creation of funds like Shared Impact is that we don't have enough funds that provide direct risk capital to frontline social purpose organizations. And that is, a, that is a big problem that is now emerging. 
So it's, it's no good creating funds of funds if there's simply not enough funds out there. It is, of course, understandable why this is the case, because it's difficult to create these funds. You have to raise the money, you have to collect a team of people together to, and you have to, to, who understand social investment, and you have to start doing deals. So it's much easier to create funds of funds rather than to create these direct funds. So that is, that is one, of, one of the ch challenges going forward. I think that there's huge opportunity in the next few years, but the jury is still out on how this market will develop. At the moment, we are at a critical juncture in the UK. It's very exciting. There's lots of new money coming in. There are lots of new products that have been launched, but still unproven. But there will also be setbacks. And how will the market respond to setbacks? So the market will not develop in a linear way. And we still haven't come across those setbacks yet, but they will come. And there are cynics out there who will use those setbacks to turn back the tide of social investment. So we have, as a movement, to be um, careful about um, how we both design products and funds and how we implement those products and funds. And the mistakes usually will occur in one or other or both of these arenas. Um, I think that's the, um, the, the excitement and the challenge going forward in, in the next few years. But we should always pay attention that the real work of building this market is often the mundane and the boring. But unless we can get the boring stuff right, this market will not develop. Thank you. Um, in order to get funding for, um, for an idea to get the company to launch, you need a bunch of great ingredients and a good chef. Um, and I know that you are a great keen amateur chef. So please describe the recipe for getting more investable social entrepreneurs in Europe. The, the, um, the mentoring and the um, the, sort of the cultivation of entrepreneurs is, um, is, is, a, is a sort of notoriously difficult problem. I think um, that the, it, it, it's a process that you can make, you can, um, you can sort of swerve to do two, two approaches that are wrong. One is to over plan. So, um, you know, this is why a lot of MBAs, for example, never become entrepreneurs because they spend so much time thinking about the business plan and, and this sort of analysis paralysis that they never actually get on and launch the venture. The other mistake is there's the chaotic approach, just make it up as you go along and just simply- The launch and, and learn and, approach. And yeah. launch and launch. But actually, there is something in between, which is to, to launch and to sort of learn by walking, to actually get out there with a minimum viable product and to iterate. So I think, that, so I think the, the key thing I w observe about entrepreneurs is that the really successful ones iterate their idea. So the initial idea that you have as an entrepreneur is usually not the idea that you will eventually make you successful. So you have to have the guts to learn from the market and find out what value customers really will pay for and then to move your business model to that. I mean, when, when cooking, you need to balance saltiness and sweetness, bitterness with sourness. And I mean, see, a lot of these fund for social entrepreneurs now, they need to balance several dimensions and factors. How good are they in doing that? Or are they sort of, you talked about understanding balance sheets, about sort of... I think in the, in the creation of funds, in the impact investing space, in the social investment market, it's, it's important that we don't lose sight of why we engage in social investment. We're all engaged in social investment to help the beneficiaries in order to promote positive change in society. So when we design these funds or to design new financial instruments, we should always work from the ground up. These, these instruments are designed to help this particular target beneficiary group. And then you design the fund back to the right types of investors. The mistake I see worryingly being made is the process is back to front. So people start from their investors and what they want, and usually they have unrealistic financial return targets. And then the fund is designed to pander to them, 
And then the problem there is that then the fund doesn't really address the real needs of the marketplace. Interesting. We'll get back to that later. Thank you so much. And uh, our next speaker, yes, he certainly did. Uh, our next speaker, if you look at the, his bio, um, you get the impression he's been all over the place. Uh, he's been one of the leading venture capitalist companies in Europe. He's worked at a tech startup, founded a software company in Munich, started electric engineering in France, and got an MBA in Berkeley in between. It's very fitting then that he's become the third head of investment at a social venture firm, the first pan European all over the place impact investment fund. Give some applause to the next speaker, Florian Eber. Thank you very much, and um, I'm happy actually that I had Paul here, so we are, because I will be talking about the developed world, and we had a lot of sessions here about the developing countries and the billions which are managed there. Um, our world is a little bit smaller, UK is growing now. Um, my name is Florian, I work for the Social Venture Fund, I'm a co-founder, we are based in Munich, as many of you know, the famous Oktoberfest, another social event with a little different outcome. Um, a few facts on the fund, um, it's structured like a classic private equity fund, um, we specifically did that to have um, right now a few, but have institutional investors feel comfortable in the, in the structure itself. Um, the fund is a little bit over 7 million euros large, um, we are investing since end of 2010, um, the ticket size is about 500,000 uh, euros per investment uh, in European um, social businesses and there is no um, hard um, criteria on the themes it has to be impact which is you know you can have a long session what that means um, one good um, way to describe it is that we like businesses who are directly Paul just mentioned it working with a beneficiary um, so not any CSR initiatives or projects, but something which does something directly and solves a direct social problem. Um, we invest all over Europe. I'll come to that. That's my core topic to tell you a little bit about our approach. Um, and yeah, we are about five people in Munich. So Johannes, Weber and I are the founders of the fund. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about pan-European investing. Um, we are based in Germany, and if you hear a lot about Germany in the news right now, economy is great, we have low unemployment, but we also have within Germany social challenges. Um, I'll give you at the end two examples where we are actually working on helping the state and be more efficient, uh, working with certain uh, groups. Um, now, why are we having this topic of uh, European um, investing? Um, when we go after a topic or find a social business which we really like, which addresses a, a, an interesting or a big social challenge, um, we want to invest in the best of breeds. So that means the best innovation, but also in the best team. And we are not looking then only within Germany, we will look all over Europe, what's the best approach to this problem, because only the best approach has the chance of solving it and scaling up. And um, for this, you have two scenarios, a little bit out of also out of a German investor pers perspective, which is the majority base of our investors. Um, you try to either find something within Germany, build it, and then scale it out to other European countries. It's in technology venturing a classic approach, how you scale something, and out of a um, impact investing um, expectation, it also scales the impact beyond the borders. Um, the other approach is if you actually find out better innovation and team is outside of Germany. We try to finance that company, often with regional um, um, investors, and then bring that actually back to Germany or other countries. So there's no limitation on um, where we scale it. Um, there's a challenge with that. Paul touched it a little bit. You have to think about it from the day one when you set up your fund, because the expectation of the investors has to match that approach. And the typical what we also noticed when we were fundraising, which is, yeah, we went through that, that's the toughest part. So for every entrepreneur in here, we also have to raise our funds and it's not a very easy job. Um, so the investors, most of them like to invest in front of their door. So preferable, I'm, I live in Hamburg, so I wanna find it something around Hamburg and often it's in the news and then the investor feels happy about it. So we were, really pushing on the topic not to limit our fund and the expectation of the investors only to Germany and found a good 
base of investors from, I think, four countries we have. We have Germany, Switzerland, Austria. We have UK funds and uh, UK investors, foundations into our fund, which was really a big thing to get this UK world into a German fund um, the first time. And we have one bank, which is actually the mother is Unicredit, so it's, you can almost say it's Italian, um, who is um, part of our investor base. Um, the second challenge you have when you have solved that part is the businesses to look at have to fit that philosophy. So not every business can be brought in any other country because not only the languages, obviously, but the cultures are differently, but the governmental systems. And many social enterprises rely on certain income um, areas from the state. So the state system is not, or healthcare system is not set up to support that. You have to be careful to expand in these countries. So that's something we always have to have a very clear eye on. And that's why we need usually local teams, expertise, and most likely co-investors or investors for that case who are familiar with those markets. Um, for the approaches you have on, on, on scaling out the businesses, it's, you know, you have, you can try to license if you're a technology-driven company or product-driven. Um, you can try to do the franchise approach. I know there are a lot of discussions about social franchising. We looked at it a lot. I'm a little skeptical that the whole franchising works that easy because it's about the people who then, um, just giving a franchise license out will not be successful. So you have to find the right team. So we'd rather work than with um, subsidiaries or partner companies or even set up our own entity over there with the investor together. Um, Maybe two examples, so we're not only thinking about this, we, not all the way through, but two, two of our investments, we already um, pursued that approach. The first one was our first investment, end of 2010, it's a company called Verba Voice. Um, it has an internet-based translation service for deaf people, so ha helping them communicate, hearing impaired, helping them communicate in a very efficient way. We now build up the company in Germany. There are close to break even this year. So that's you know one of these major hurdles every startup has to overcome at some point. Um, and we already have talks with different entrepreneurs in different countries in Europe, but also funds to work out a way to scale them out into different European countries. And we'll have to find out the one um, which fits best. And, but it's a product which is in general totally universal. So you can use the product if you have the right team in place in, in, in Netherlands, UK, or even at some point, the vision of, our, of the founder there is, is to use it even in, you know, you can use it in Africa or wherever you want. The second and uh, last example um, is, a, is a topic um, which we pursued that since the beginning of the fund, which we really love, is um, helping people with autism, especially Asperger's syndrome, to get back to professional life and they have really the gift to work very diligent and you can use them as IT consultants and for quality control. And there are a lot of concepts, we didn't invent it, um, there are a lot of concepts around Europe, even the US, um, I think even in Asia, who pursue that approach. But it took us one and a half years to evaluate all of these and see which one is matching actually in Germany um, best um, considering the German system, how you get the funding because most of these incomes is is uh, it's part of from the from the um, corporates at the end when they work, but in the training phase when you coach them, uh, you need some government uh, from the healthcare uh, services some money, and we found a company in Belgium which is a little bit under the radar screen in that market, but they are actually the largest in this sector, and uh, we first wanted to fund them because that was our idea. We fund them and with their help, and then they really have some money and and and, and time to help us build it. And they said, no, we don't need money, we'll help you anyhow. So they were uh, they are a profitable company. He said, you know, it's, he, he has a charitable um, limited, so he cannot even take the money. Or he, has to, he, has, he is profitable, he doesn't need anything. So they were helping us anyhow. And we had the right team in Germany and founded the, helped founding that company and set it up. And with that approach, um, we're building it up now in Germany. So... That's, that's our approach, and I hope we'll have soon more funds um, thinking that way. Great, thank you. Um, tell us the name of the last company again, so we know. Yeah, the company is called Auticon. Auticon. 
I mean, you look like a very normal guy and you have a normal background in market venture investing and so on. Uh, are there any differences you see between scaling a normal business and a sort of social enterprise? Um, at the end of the day, what I always try to, to, when I talk to the social entrepreneurs, they're all doing good and they're doing very good stuff, but the real world is tough for a social entrepreneur and a normal entrepreneur. The market is out there, it's tough. They have to work, Paul mentioned it a little bit, on, on their financials, they have to go out there, sell something, it's not free. Doing good doesn't mean that you grow doing nothing. So the, the, the challenge is, is almost bigger because they try to balance the social impact with the, with the financial impact. And I just had the discussion yesterday with, the, with one of our portfolios, which you know, the, the founder would like to focus on a certain part of the business which has right now the higher social impact. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure that if, if they would pursue it for like half a year, year, the danger is high that the whole company collapses and then it's for nothing. So sometimes you actually have to sacrifice a little bit of a social impact to win the game on the long run. So changing the world means that you have actually a tougher journey ahead uh, yeah. than yeah. if you just want to be the normal company. Exactly. And so how, how do you manage these entrepreneurs then? I mean, when you do these investments, um, I mean, even if you, do, if you look disciplined, I know you get manipulated by your, t your daughters. <laughs> so. Um, How do you make sure you're not getting manipulated by these entrepreneurs that say that we're just... Yeah, them? so that's why, you know, there's the private equity has some good mechanisms there to structure that with reporting. Um, you have certain shareholder rights. As, as much as you trust in the first moment each other, that's why you do the deal. You, you know, they have to trust you as a social um, investor and you have to trust them to build up the business. But at the end of the day, there have to be some terms in place which control them, they're mean and everyone hates them when you negotiate it, um, but it helps you um, set the stage and the discipline and, and I think at the end often helps to, to, to grow the company. Nevertheless, you have to say, and even in private equity, you know, some people run around and I built this company, I was the investor, it's the entrepreneur who builds it yeah. at the end of the day. It's more the protection of the money because it's not our money. If it would be mine, I, there are some people I would give it right away because I trust them but it's third party mon money and we will only open these pockets, especially institutional pockets, if it's professionally managed. Thank you so much. Uh, join me here and please give him a hand. Um, and we will start taking some questions from the audience, uh, if there are any. Someone's waving over there. Uh, Jan on his fast feet again. Hello, I'm Tony from EcoCapital. Um, I've been sitting here for a day and a half, um, listening about impact uh, investment, impact funds, etc., getting some really interesting ideas. Um, but I came to this one f looking for new funds doing new things, and it sounds like it's um, especially Fabio, Bo, and and Paul. I'd love to hear your thoughts on accountability. What I haven't heard is accountability. You know, you give these funds to third party, third party intermediaries or whatever, and I'm, I'm not hearing about the accountability the other way, from the grassroots up, whether or not the investors are actually being asked to be accountable to make sure that the impacts that they are supposedly financing are actually, not only actually happening from a, from a measurement point of view, but there's accountability, which is a much broader issue than just d is there an impact and how many jobs were uh, created and you so know, how are you just... working with measurement gentlemen no it's not about measurement it's about accountability yep. i'm sorry w what do you mean exactly <laughs> well when you're investing you invest especially fabio you and i spoke about this yesterday but you're investing in third party so they're going to send out they're going to actually give the loans how about the people that are looking for the loans and they have an idea of, of how this money is supposed to be able to help them and and move them forward Yet, the, the accountability, where does the accountability from your side, where does it begin, where does it end, and whether or not it's pushed down or pushed up? Okay, so um, I, I briefly explain our uh, investment process. So in our investment process, it's true, is concentrated on the intermediaries. But you cannot understand the intermediary if you don't go and look for the clients. So, in fact, when we do a full due diligence, it's the same... We, I mean, we, we've been doing this for seven years now. Uh, we've, we've, we've done 600 due diligences. Each time we go and see the clients, 
because we have to get uh, we we have to understand if what the people the, the the management or the board of the financial institution is is saying is true and is also respected at the other end of the the client and uh, most of the investors that invest in a, a microfinance fund or a small enterprise fund they do it because they target the the end client so for them it's also very important to have a story so typically in on in symbiotics what we've been doing in wh when we started the credit risk report was enough uh, to assess the risk because microfinance was good nobody was questioning the fact that microfinance was good but in 2008 2010 people started to questioning because in fact it was much more complex than just giving a loan to a farmer etc you we've been i mean the industry was growing very fast and and, and getting more complex with some consumption uh, specialized institution entering the market so we've decided to create a social responsibility report to complement uh, the decision making process of the investor in saying okay you have a, a triple b credit risk and you have a triple c in social responsibility so maybe that's something that the fund manager doesn't want so typically that's something that's how we we've addressed a bit this this social impact um uh, issue in 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 our in our process so up to now um investors especially private clients they come mostly for the story that it brings it doesn't mean that they don't look at the return they look at the return it's a financial instrument it's it's standard in that sense but they like the story that is behind then we have another bench of of clients especially the pension funds they rather look at the financial aspect and they like it because it's resilient it's stable it's four to six percent per year and, and they like it very much and the story is also important but it come on the second uh, range i would say i'll stop uh, there and you can talk later on because we i want to make sure that we get a few que more questions from the audience and we have someone here yeah i have uh, two questions and uh, um florian uh, given the size of your fund uh, you're clearly not in it for the money you know i've been a vc myself so um, with that fund, you're not going to get rich. I would uh, so two questions to um, uh, Paul and Bo. Would you also mind sharing your business uh, uh, model and the size and the structure of your fund with us, so that we can get um, an, um, uh, an order of magnitude uh, of where you are and how you how you operate as a business? Firstly and secondly, because my assumption is that uh, you, uh, your funds are also relatively small if you compare it to mainstream private equity or venture capital funds. Um, so. Um, the next question is for Paul. Um, what is happening at the European level to help uh, scale this up? Because you are involved in these activities, and I think that would be interesting to share with the audience. A book, quick about your business model, and then we'll over to Paul. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. This isn't an asset management play for us. And, you know, we have a very strong relationship with United's nonprofit. Uh, which helps us out on operating costs and with the idea that they share in a lot of the management fees and carry that will come from these deals that we put together. So going on in the future, the idea is that we will put together a robust enough portfolio that we will be able to stand on our own within a one to two year period. Uh, but until then, we receive a lot of support from the nonprofit to prove that livelihood ventures are scalable. Thank you. On the, on the European level, uh, we are still working about uh, to prepare for the new structural funds that will come in 2014. There's again a real problem of investment readiness um, at, all, all, at all levels. So on the demand side, you know, the social enterprises, um, getting them financially literate. Um, on the funders side, um, getting them how, how you manage these funds. And on the government side, you know, how, how, what interventions can governments do to catalyze these markets? So there's still a lot of preparatory work um, to, to come. Um, but it is, but we now recognise the issue around preparing the ground for the for the launch of the new European funds. And we have the next question over here. Yeah, Simon Chisholm from uh, Resonance. We're a UK social finance company um, launching a number of direct impact investment funds this year. Um, really, the common theme I, I can hear from today is that uh, you know there is a lot of innovation happening in the sector and a lot of new funds coming to market and another theme from the last couple of days has been to what extent we try and kind of create new things or use the existing channels that exist so I've got two general questions for the panel one is um, you know 
where do they see that balance in terms of creating new structures versus using the existing distribution channels that uh, that are out there with the, with the traditional finance institutions? And the second is, you know, how do we avoid creating an excessive cost base? Because we need to demonstrate to investors that that actually what is being produced here is also a cost efficient solution. So where can we find, you know, innovative ways of being more cost efficient in this structure? I'll have Florian answer that. I may I would answer the first question. Um, so I wouldn't say it's much innovative to um, copy private equity to the social sector, you know, and doing pan-European, going back to what I said before, where you have to be... So the reason why you do that is that many investors are only comfortable in that zone. So they know the structures, they know the contracts. That's how you get for now a little easier the, the, the investors. Where you do have to be very innovative, and that's... a uh, challenge and no one could teach me that from my past because it did classic venture capital a lot um, is how you structure deals with social um, social entrepreneurs social businesses you know it's a total different you know the whole big discussion will there be an exit how will it be is it fair um, I don't know who said it it's that the entrepreneur usually wants to buy it back but you know you need to make a return that's all very tricky stuff and everyone has to be comfortable with it and you sometimes feel in the middle, well, you play a little bit, you know, you control them, their, their faith for the future, and they're totally scared of that. You know, the normal tech entrepreneur is only scared, yeah, will I sell high enough? You know, or will this be the, the next big thing? The social entrepreneur is very worried about his mission, so you have a lot of different conflicts of interest when um, structuring those um, finances, and, and that's where you have to be very innovative. And I think we will learn a lot over the next months, years, um, how to do that. And apart from that, um, yeah, I think there should be much more innovative finance, and I think Paul is more in, in that, um, um, ways of financing, you know, also early stage and, and charitable entities. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, final comment? Yeah, I just want to add something because the question is, is very relevant uh, because uh, I was presenting one of the product which is the, the one with Oxfam and 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 um, so Oxfam came to us and say we want to target small enterprise. So we look at our model and we, we, we thought look it, it, it can work but we have to adjust a bit because there are not only financial institutions doing uh, small enterprise uh, investing. There are uh, specialized banks, so we have to find them. There are local intermediaries, which, which is another story, but local in intermediaries, as I said, two, two, uh, three quarter are doing equity, which is something new for us. So uh, when you have such a demand coming from s such an institution, you have to think how to keep doing the same thing, not like reinvent all the time this, the story. Uh, keep doing the same thing with the same efficiency and do it well, sustainably, with sust sustainability. Uh, because uh, the efficiency in that world is very, very key. Uh, you cannot start doing things uh, if you don't cover your costs. So we cover our costs and our growth um, and, and we, we do it efficiently. And uh, typically Oxfam wanted initially to target directly the small enterprises, but forget it. You cannot come from, from UK or Geneva and target small enterprise and expect a return of that much. and. And, and everything is fine. I mean, it doesn't work like that. So you have to be innovative, but uh, keep the same, the same structure. I mean, we haven't changed our investment value chain doing this new fund. So uh, that was my comment. And on that note, we'll end from here. 